Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is John Thrasher, Assistant Professor in the Philosophy Department and in the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy at Chapman University. His new book, co-authored with Daniel Halliday, is The Ethics of Capitalism, an Introduction. Welcome to Free Thoughts, John. Oh, thanks for having me. So your, your book is a textbook uh, of sorts, uh, maybe a little bit, definitely more readable than your average textbook, but it's a textbook. What was the intended audience and, and purpose of the book? Well, the intended audience started out as as undergraduates and is still primarily focused on undergraduates, although we think other people will probably get something out of reading it. But the book kind of came about from teaching some classes in this general area and just noticing that basically everyone seemed to hate capitalism for some reason or another. Uh, this seemed to be true on the left and the right. And in the book, we talk about this, that if you just, when we first started writing that, we we entered in on Google um, for an auto-completion, you know, capitalism is, and we got up all kinds of lists of things like bad, evil, the root of all evils, you know, slavery, that kind of thing. And so it just kind of puzzled us why, why everyone hated capitalism and then what it is that they exactly hated. Was it capitalism exactly, or was it the status quo, or was it in other kinds of injustice that they were equating with capitalism? And this led us to to want to ask more kind of detailed and involved questions about capitalism, its ethics, and uh, people's responses to it. This dislike of capitalism certainly seems to have been a long time feature on the left, and you know we're seeing a lot more of it on the right with the especially like national conservatism and the populist movement there. But is this really a new thing? Like, do people dislike capitalism or whatever they imagine capitalism to be more than they used to? It's hard to say. I mean, I can say from our experience writing the book, when we started writing the book, um, people didn't like capitalism, but it was nowhere near as widespread as it got when we basically were finishing the book and, and um, after we published it. Um, and some of that had to do, I think, with uh, the rise of kind of the nationalist right. So you were kind of getting it from both sides. Um, but it does seem to be more mainstream than before. So when you have outlets, you know, as diverse as Teen Vogue and the Claremont Review of Books, both attacking capitalism, uh, you know that something something is going on. Um, we also started to notice a bunch of other works on capitalism books. So uh, Tama Piketty's book, for instance, on capital in the 21st century is very popular. Uh, Anthony Lowenstein, uh, Naomi Klein, um, Shoshana Zoboff, uh, Orrin Cass on the right. A lot of people were coming out with books. And what we noticed about them was they all had a kind of, there was a modifier to capitalism. So in Piketty's book, he talks about patrimonial capitalism. Lowenstein talks about disaster capitalism. Klein talks about, you know, the shock doctrine and disaster capitalism or surveillance capitalism with Zuboff or, or these kind of things. And what we started thinking is, well, maybe it's just that first modifier that people don't like. It's the surveillance or it's the, you know, the patrimonial aspect or it's the disaster part or whatever. Is it really capitalism that people are objecting to? Um, so then we started kind of digging into that. But you're right that people have been hating capitalism since the beginning, in a sense. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask when we were writing the book was, why did people think that capitalism was a good idea to begin with? Like at some point, people were at, like Adam Smith, the early political economists were advocating for capitalism. And of course, there was this great kind of explosion in the early you know, or mid 18th century on um, that, that we call capitalism. So why did people think it was a good idea at the time if indeed they did? And what would those people think today if they were looking at our society? It seems like some of these people and some of the critics you mentioned, um, they describe a lot of things as capitalism. I once heard someone, it might've been Naomi Klein, but don't quote me on that, but someone along those lines described the drug war as capitalism, which struck me as very interesting. Um, but you do hear a lot of things like this where the word is used to invoke almost all wrongs that are in the world today. Um, but it, so did you, to sort of counter that tendency, did you guys try to define it in a, in a more, you know, just at least, so at least some things are not capitalism, such as the drug war, and we can like at least get some idea of what this might be? Yeah. And so this, this really was something that was striking to us, both talking to students and, you know, reading things in the media that just basically anything that people didn't like seem to be identified with capitalism. And and we thought, well, you know, some of those things are probably related to capitalism, but some of them certainly aren't. Like when you hear, you know, racism and capitalism combined, 
well, racism has existed, you know, for all of human history, as far as we know, or slavery has existed, or, you know, sexism or whatever, right? So those can't be caused by capitalism. Now, maybe there's aspects of capitalism that make them worse, or, or perhaps even better, but they can't be the same thing, right? And so we wanted to, so as you point out, we had to de- figure out, well, can we come up with some kind of analysis or, or definition or, or specification of capitalism that allows us to kind of isolate it and think about what characteristics it has that are unique to it? Uh, and then what aspects of the status quo that people don't like um, are they pointing to and claiming that that's capitalism? And so that's actually a big part of the first chapter of the book is trying to do that. And uh, there's there's a lot of pitfalls along that way. And and one of the things that we come up with in the book is the idea that, you know, I think typically these discussions go is that we don't like something, that thing is capitalism, let's reject it in favor of what? I don't know, usually socialism, let's say. But we want to say, well, no, there's there's kind of a before capitalism and there's an after capitalism, if you want to think of it in time scale. Or we like to think of it as a kind of spatial analogy. We have a triangle in the book. Um, you know, where we have feudalism, which is kind of hierarchical societies, and socialism, which is kind of non-capitalist societies. And then we think about what are the aspects of each. And then we say, well, look, you could identify any moment in the status quo or a moment in time in a different society as being kind of some space in this triangle. It might be closer in some respects to, you know, feudalism or socialism. So then we say there's things in that you might not like about the world around you, but it's just an open question whether those are distinctive of capitalism or not. They might be vestiges of feudalism that are still around, uh, or they might be aspects of socialism or some combination. And so to really figure out what it is that you don't like, what the ethical problems that you're pointing to are, you really need to get clear on what are the distinctive characteristics of capitalism. Is there a difference between capitalism and free markets? Um, like so a, a couple of months ago, we had on a guest, uh, Corey Massimino, who calls himself a free market anti-capitalist anarchist. And so is there – is that an incoherent idea or is there a meaningful distinction? I think that there has to be a distinction in principle between markets and capitalism. So – and this is why – Now, so the the later question about free markets and anarchism is a slightly different one, but I'll just start with the first, which is that we think that markets have more or less always existed to one degree or another and will exist in basically any institutional framework. So you have markets in prisons, uh, you have markets in illegal goods, um, you know, you have markets in um, drugs or whatever it might be. You had markets in ancient Rome. Right. But a lot of these, I would not say that any of those are distinctively capitalistic in any fundamental sense. So then we ask, well, what is it? What is distinctive of capitalism? So our thinking is that capitalism is the institutional framework around markets that kind of, in some ways, to preserve the openness or functioning of markets. Um, Now, that's all very normatively loaded. And so we get pretty specific about what we mean by that. But I would just say that. Markets in capitalism are never completely free because there's these institutional structures that define uh, various kinds of behavior in the market, what acceptable contracts are, what kinds of things count as property, um, you know, how how much trade and with whom you're able to do. And so we say in capitalist societies, those tend to be kind of those parameters tend to be uh, turned in particular directions, whereas in socialist societies or kind of feudalist non-capitalist societies, they tend to be turned in other directions. Um, I understand the the the, um, the aversion to the term on some level, because, you know, as we know in the book, capitalism is a kind of. I wouldn't say it's exactly a pejorative, but it was coined by the opponents of capitalism kind of early on. And so it's not exactly probably a name that you would choose for the system that you're that you're trying to defend. But on the other hand, I just can't think of a better word for it. Um, It's just kind of broad institutional framework uh, of the sort that we see in developed and open societies. Uh, That's how I would I have more specific kind of parameters of what that amounts to. But that was the basic notion um, that we, we kind of started with. And then so we started looking, well, what what features did these types of societies share? And then thinking about, you know, well, what's essential about that and what's not? And then we kind of tried to, to zero in on what we thought um, capitalism amounted to. Well, as you point out in the book, the, and you mentioned previously, the 
the early days of capitalism before it even had a name featured various thinkers, Adam Smith probably being the most prominent, John Stuart Mill a little bit later, the people like Adam Ferguson too, who who viewed the endeavor of sort of looking at these governing systems and economics, well, that, although that term itself was a little bit new, they viewed it as sort of a holistic thing encompassing a bunch of different things, political philosophy, regular uh, normal philosophy, economics, and created a justification for capitalism that was a little bit more, I would say, rich than maybe after the 20th century when things get segmented out. Um, is that is that a sort of tradition that you were trying to resuscitate maybe, or at least like work within to try and bring something back that maybe is a way of talking about capitalism that students today haven't really heard too much? Yeah, that's exactly right. So that was definitely one of our aims. I mean, we look back at the, the early uh, defenders, but also in some ways um, like creators of what we think of as capitalism, um, especially Adam Smith, but David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, a lot of people you mentioned. We talk about these people as we thought of this as the kind of golden age of political economy. And what we mean by that is, as exactly as you were saying, is not these people weren't just economists. And in fact, the idea of an economist wasn't quite around at that time. They, you know, Adam Smith was primarily a moral philosopher, you know, or we might even say like partly a political philosopher. Uh, earlier versions of that, David Hume, one of his friends, was also, you know, a philosopher. Um, John Stuart Mill, certainly a very important philosopher. So these early political economists were certainly concerned about uh, ethics. They were concerned about political theory. They were concerned about uh, what we would probably today call political science and then kind of economics, business, those kind of things. And so it was a very holistic kind of approach. And uh, so we talk about that in the book is we call it political economy. But what we really just mean is um, – you know, an, an approach to economics that also takes seriously a lot of these other questions uh, in terms of ethics and, and politics. And so today we would probably think of this as uh, a PPE or a philosophy, politics and economics type approach, um, which I'm very much in that kind of mold. And, and I know that my co-author is as well. And so we're kind of interested in that uh, fusion and thinking about how the benefits that you can get from looking at, you know, economic questions with, you know, a moral lens and political lens. And we're thinking that it's pretty hard to to address a lot of these questions profitably without kind of triangulating in all those different ways. And so we try to do that as much as we can in the book. Um, and we look back at the history of political economy and type, look at the kinds of questions that these early political economists were, were kind of asking and answering to try to see why capitalism seems so appealing and especially appealing and compared to what? And, you know, we say, well, looking back to the society before um, or the time, the society that was kind of they were moving away from, which we characterize as a kind of feudal society. But really, it's just a hierarchical, not very open society, kind of the last gasp of these closed societies in Europe. And they're, they're arguing against that from from a lot of different angles. If you talk to a, a probably a pretty typical college student today, and it's so far as they know about Adam Smith as maybe quote unquote the founder of capitalism, it would they would they might conclude that Adam Smith and maybe even John Stuart Mill, but probably definitely Adam Smith was a reactionary, profit driven, uh, kind of business friendly guy. Um, you know, kind of into the creeping into the fascist realm, which is of course how capitalism is often described. That doesn't seem to be an accurate depiction of what Adam Smith was actually doing. No, I, Adam Smith is a kind of a great revolutionary thinker at his time, I would say. Uh, and that's not just in terms of political economy, but also his thoughts on politics. And I would also say on, on um, morality and philosophy generally. So his great friend at the time was David Hume. You know, he's one of the more kind of revolutionary thinkers of all time, I would say. And uh, my interpretation of Smith is that he kind of follows along in, in Hume's footsteps in a lot of ways. And you can say the same thing about John Stuart Mill. Now, Mill was a um, political uh, reformer. Uh, he, he's a complicated figure. Uh, you know, he was on the board of the East India Company for a long time and uh, a manager there, but he was also a reformer in favor of women's rights and contraceptives. And so he's he's kind of all over the place, as a lot of these guys are. And, and part of the reason is because their world is changing pretty rapidly. Things are changing and they're trying to make sense of them and they're trying to come up with ways to think through this new world that is starting that, you know, they're kind of in the birth pangs of in a sense. And, and Smith probably does this better than anyone else. And the wealth of nations, I think, could profitably be read as a kind of blueprint for that world. And, you know, it's probably no surprise that Adam Smith, unlike virtually all of his contemporaries, 
You know, he's he's got what we would consider the right answers on things like slavery, imperialism, colonialism, on the American Revolution, even. Um, so the reason for that, I think, though, is that he he has a frame of mind that's that he's he's looking at things in a way that we would, I think, find more congenial than a lot of others. Now, contrast that to <clears throat> to the kind of the hero of the anti-capitalist, which I would say maybe you could pick two, but certainly Marx, probably Rousseau as well. And these are actual reactionaries. I mean, these are people who are reacting against the world that they see emerging around them and trying to kind of either go back to some kind of um, some kind of uh, Edenic past in the in this in Rousseau sense or uh, towards a kind of post-millenarian future uh, and, and in Marx's sense. And so I basically think that like part of the reason why we focus in the book on a lot of these characters, which we do, so we, we follow uh, a lot of the thoughts of people like Smith and Mill and, and, and even Marx a little bit throughout the book is to kind of show their train of thought and what they're responding to. And um, students tend to, I think, be surprised when they, part of the thing when we're teaching this book and, and on the website, um, ethicsofcapitalism.com, we have a model syllabus that uh, people can can use to if they want to teach the book. And on that, there's also a lot of uh, primary sources that we teach with the book. So John Stuart Mill and, and Smith. And when students read those, they're often, I think, surprised at how how different these people turn out to be than what their what their kind of cartoonish image of them is. And we try to quote them a lot in the book, although there's, you know, kind of limits to that. We also found, however, when we were teaching, and one of the reasons why we wrote the book is just that students have a little trouble with some of the primary texts because they're written, you know, in the 18th century or 19th century. Uh, and so sometimes it's important to kind of give them some context for that. And part of that is is trying to give them the political and economic context that a lot of these these writers are working in. You quote Elizabeth Anderson, who's been a guest on Free Thoughts a couple times, and her quote that said, free markets used to be a cause of the left, which is an interesting quote, but also kind of maybe is a little bit difficult because it plays into this left-right distinction, uh, which doesn't seem to make much sense. But at least insofar as we're saying that there was a time when champions of free markets were radical social reformers looking to make the world more egalitarian, I guess, in the way that you described, yeah. Exactly. And then, I mean, that's one of the things that we wanted to highlight in the book. Uh, I totally agree with you that thinking in terms of left and right is extraordinarily confusing and I think misleading. And I even like lapsed into it earlier when I was thinking in terms of one dimension of time. And that's precisely why when we're thinking, when we were thinking about capitalism and socialism, we wanted to, to think about it in a kind of two dimensional, you know, triangular plane, if that makes sense, to think about it in, in slightly different ways. And, um, but the point to note is just that the people who cared about capitalism at the outset also cared about what we would consider today things like egalitarianism, uh, sometimes justice, but certainly making people's lives better, giving them more opportunities to live different kinds of lives, uh, expanding their um, expanding what kinds of relationships that they could have or what you know they could think about their their children doing, and so I think it's it's strange today to to for people to kind of miss that aspect of it. And so that was one thing that we wanted to, we wanted to highlight. But also, you know, we wanted to again bring some of these characters back and think about well, what of their concerns are still live issues today. You know, what are things that they would still have questions about um, d despite the kind of um, the changes that have happened. Is there a tension between those things between capitalism and the pursuit of the various other values that you mentioned, like justice, such that you are eventually going to get a coming apart, a tearing apart there. I'm Because I'm thinking of one of the common objections you hear about a capitalistic system is that it's almost in a sense fundamentally anti-ethical, that, that ethics is about you know figuring out what the right values are in your life and in the world and the actions we can take to pursue those. But capitalism necessarily by its very nature reduces value to profits, to what you can buy and sell and for how much. You know, like Milton Friedman say, you know, a, a corporation's only responsibility is to maximize profits for its shareholders and kind of all these other things, justice and compassion and respect and the good of people be damned is the way that that gets interpreted. 
is that a fundamental tension? Like how can you in a in a system that measures everything based on how much it costs in the market and how much profit you can make by selling it, how can you have space for those other values? I sometimes we, we sometimes get asked questions, uh, not quite this question, but along these lines, are they talking about something like the logic of capitalism or or you know the uh, this kind of thing that the capitalism kind of demands a certain kind of result or that it measures things along one one type of value, let's say money, which is um, in the background there as well. And I would just say that um, that's certainly a possibility within a capitalist system. But what capitalism does, uh, from my point of view, is it creates a lot of possibilities for value that then people can then choose to uh, pursue or then commensurate in various ways in the market and outside of the market. So uh, there's no law of capitalism that says one must kind of advance the profit in the most narrow way possible or something like that. That's a conversation we can have about what the role for businesses should be in a capitalist society. So that's exactly what Milton Friedman was doing when he was making that case, right? And others have responded to that case since then. And so one of the things that we wanted to point out in the book, and I think in some ways the, the great um, purpose of the book is to is to raise this point and say that there's a lot of ethical questions that you can have within a capitalist society that are not answered by capitalism itself, by existence of capitalism. So in some ways, that's to, to kind of push back and say that capitalism is a pretty diverse thing. It's a pretty diverse set of institutional structures that all have certain characteristics, but that there's a lot of different ways of doing them. And within that, there's a lot of different ways to, to live your lives and to behave, live your life and behave. And so, you know, oftentimes if you have a class on capitalism of the, of the sort that like Dan or I might have been asked to teach, um, you know, on capitalism or something like that, or socialism or justice and economics, it might just be a class about capitalism versus socialism, right? Like what's the ethically more acceptable system? And we really didn't like that kind of, and so you might read something like Nozick or Jason Brennan on the one hand, and then like Jerry Cohen on the other hand, right? Rejecting capitalism and say, well, here's these two kind of ideal systems. Which one do we like? And we really wanted to reject that approach because we wanted to say that within a capitalist society. So, so basically, the point is to say there that um, the ethical question is about whether you want ethics or whether you want capitalism, right? So, capitalism does all these great things, but it can't be an ethical. It, it can't be there can't be interesting ethical questions asked within capitalism, right? It's about uh, efficiency or welfare or something like that. And then on the other side, you have socialism, which has all these drawbacks. Um, but it might it might give you the ethical advantages that you want. And we want to say, it seems within a capital system, there's a ton of ethical questions that you can still ask profitably without rejecting capitalism, right? And so that's that's kind of where we're coming from. And that that question about businesses and the role of businesses and the ethical responsibility of businesses and, and those types of questions about consumption or about whatever it might be, to me, those are ethical questions um, that don't, you know, answering them one way doesn't, make you into a socialist or turn you into an anti-capitalist. It seems like there's a lot of different ways of conceiving about how different kinds of businesses should um, should work within a capitalist society. Now, this this may be preempting a later question that you have, but, you know, because of the way that we think about capitalism um, it, as this kind of uh, institutional structure that has a bunch of different characteristics, uh, every capitalist society is going to exist within a democratic society for the most part. Um, and so politics and economics are not going to be separate and they need to be kind of intertwined in various ways. And so in a democratic society, these are the kinds of questions that we're always in some sense negotiating with one another as we go along. So capitalism doesn't answer all of those questions. Um, they have to be answered by people thinking through um, ethical questions individually, but also uh, questions that we, we think about democratically too. Yeah, you, we were talking about socialism and capitalism, but you brought up feudalism a couple of times as one of the points on your triangle. It's interesting that I, it struck me when you I said, okay, feudalism, that seems quite long gone. Uh, I'm picturing like the constitutional peasant and Monty Python or something. It's been a, quite a while since we've had a feudalistic society. How How is that a like a relevant point on the triangle uh, that you're kind of describing between capitalism, socialism, and feudalism? Well, we thought it was um, an important point in logical space, but also one that you do see around you in various aspects. So 
Um, we think of feudalism as char characterized primarily by uh, societies uh, that they're that have status hierarchies, where there might be some private ownership, um, and there's not full public ownership of of everything, but that it's not very widespread, and the people who who do have the ownership of goods and oftentimes services, they also have other kinds of privileges, usually in terms of power, being able to kind of uh, order people around. People have different statuses in those societies that allow them uh, different privileges with respect to what they can do, the kind of jobs they can have, that kind of thing. And, and also that the economy tends to be pretty, the economy and the political system tends to be pretty closed. And, and planned in various ways. Um, so either a small group of elites or, or um, you know, something like that that's running the show. So we thought that that was important, partly because that's a pro we think that's a much better characterization of a lot of the societies that existed before capitalism came along, say in Europe, but also a good characterization of a lot of societies that still exist that don't seem to be obviously, you know, socialist in the way that we might think about it, but that are also uh, not capitalist in the sense uh, that we describe it. And so one of the things that we noticed, and again, this was also influenced by Elizabeth Anderson's work, was just thinking, you know, what aspects of that people point to as being maybe unjust or unethical or just bad in some other way uh, in our current system might actually be vestiges of kind of feudal society um, that still kind of exists, that, you know, capitalism in some sense never overturned, or maybe these are kind of neo-feudal um, revivals in some in some ways or something like that. And of course, we use feudal kind of advisedly, like it does kind of sound like a Monty Python or a, a Game of Thrones type of situation, but, um, but we're really just thinking of kind of uh, hierarchical closed societies, uh, you know, Probably what North Wallace and one guess would call, you know, um, uh, natural states or, or something like that, or extractive societies. That that's that's really what our target is there. Well, there seems to be in the well in recent rhetoric. You mentioned Elizabeth Anderson. You also mentioned Piketty. Some of them do like to describe. I mean, Elizabeth in particular with her private governance book, but but do like to describe that this sort of tendency of capitalism to create these hierarchies. And Aaron kind of alluded to them too, that, that maybe there is a feudal tendency in capitalism unless you maybe change some rules or have some different taxation or something like that. I think, um, so one of the insights of a couple of important works in, I guess what you might call development economics, so the Asimoglu and Robinson stuff, and also the North Wallace and Weingas is it seems to be that, I think sometimes we think about this as, you know, capitalism is creating these things, but it might be more uh, true to say that these are just features of humans in some sense of living together, that they tend to want to organize themselves in ways, you know, where they can organize the rents together or benefit one another, those kind of things. And capitalism, um, at least the way that I view it, it has it pushes against a lot of those tendencies and it makes them very expensive or difficult. Um, but people find ways around it or they sometimes can use the, the elements of capitalism uh, to, to magnify some of those aspects. And so, you know, so one of the questions that we want to ask is at least in, so in regards to say what um, Anderson is concerned with in, in workplaces, you know, is this a feature of capitalism that is, is is this something that we should be worried about going forward as we become more capitalist say or is this something and, and so should this lead us in the direction maybe away from capitalism or is this a revival of a kind of older form of human organization that um maybe capitalism had done something to kind of uh reduce but maybe is coming back so i guess the question you're kind of always asking is what's causing what what, what what's the real um you know, what's the disease here? If you want to think of it as a bad thing, it's like you need to know what that is before you can think about what a possible cure might be. And, you know, if you thought the capitalism is what's responsible, but in fact, it's feudalism that's responsible or some vestige of it, then by reducing capitalism, you might actually be doing something worse. You know, you might be making the problem worse. And so, for instance, with Piketty is a great example. Like if you look at his work, which his most recent book is incredibly expansive, but if you just look at capital, you know, a lot of what's going on there, it seems to be, it has to do with uh, uh, re real estate, basically, holdings by people through families, so patrimonial real estate holdings, and particular kinds of environments where you have both a low-growth economy and you have, 
you know, massive booms and, and real estate values that has been passed down over, over time. And so, you know, the case that he's making is, well, this looks like the, the classic rentier coming back, you know, being able to kind of extract rents from the population without having to work. And, you know, the question to ask there is, well, is that a natural, he thinks that this is kind of a law of capitalism that this will happen. Um, maybe, but it might just be a feature of uh, the institutional structure that's allowing these huge gains from real estate to go on while at the same time having very low growth environments in terms of like uh, capital returns. So anyways, there's, there's a lot going on there, but the point is just to ask uh, for us to point out is to think, you know, sometimes these things might be related uh, to capitalism directly, but they might not be. And so it's important to figure that out. So a lot of the work that we're interested in doing since then is kind of teasing out what those those causal and logical relations are. Is there a role then for potentially government in addressing these? So let's take the some of the feudalistic aspects that people identify in capitalism, um, and we'll go with you know maybe the the awesome power of bosses over their employees in large firms. Um, that you know can sometimes feel disproportionate or lead to increased inequality or whatever else. Um, that that you know, even if that is we we identify that as feudalism and not pure capitalism, it still exists within these capitalistic firms, and it has a strong cultural component, both you know within those firms and among the people who run them. That that's the way that they're used to running things, and outside of it, in terms of the way that we you know lionize the the like swashbuckling CEO, you know, Steve Jobs is the hero and Elon Musk is the hero and so on. Um, is there then a role for government to step in and say, we're going to take steps to kind of rein in this stuff. We're going to limit capitalism in a way to like readjust that culture. Or is there a way to fix these problems without having something outside of the system come in and put a thumb on the scale to move them in maybe a less futile direction? Well, the first thing I would say is that I think it's it's very misleading to think of letting government come in and fix capitalism, just like putting it that way, which I think is a very natural way to think of things. And so like in the political discourse, but also um, in economics or in political science, you would hear this as well. And the reason is because at least in our way of thinking about it, and I think this is definitely the right way to think about it, is that Capitalism is not something outside of the political process. It's it's kind of an emergent, complex social system that's partly determined by the political system that it's working within and the legal structure and the norms and various other things. And so, so anyways, the point is what I would say is there is that like if you're seeing problems in the status quo or things that you think are problems, um, it's weird to think of the government going in and fixing it because in some sense – that whole structure is what's allowing the emergence of this thing to go on. Now, it might be that people are acting illegally or that they're skirting the law or that there's loopholes or something like that, in which case, then yes, the government does need to go in and fix it. But um, it's probably the case that whatever the rules that exist now are the things that are making that um, more attractive for people to, to behave in that way or for those kinds of norms to emerge. And so you have to look very carefully at that as well. So... Anyways, that's a kind of, uh, I don't mean to be fiddly with that point, but just to say that we shouldn't think of capitalism as an economic system that can then be tinkered with by the political system, because the two are not separate. Um, they're connected in very important ways. And uh, in fact, I would say they're they're kind of overlapping and connected in very complex ways. And so um, the vision of the, the kind of... Um, the politician or the political system that can then kind of start twisting the dials on the system is, I think, very much mistaken. And um, but then that does raise the question, well, what what are the kind of remedies for this? And I think, well, the first thing is to recognize when there are problems and, and so to talk about them openly. And then, of course, think of some political solutions, some legal solutions, um, some solutions in terms of moral suasion, but also um, in terms of different kinds of firms, different kinds of contract types, those kind of things, which can really expand the possibilities of, of options within a capitalist system. And so one of the things I would say is that one of the huge advantages that I see of capitalism over every other system is just the diversity of types of, say, employee-employer relationships that are possible in terms of the possible kinds of employment contracts, in terms of the possible types of contracts that you can have for trade or for services. And also, um, you know, 
for the, the different kinds of legal protections of property that exist that just don't exist under any uh, conceivable socialist or feudalist system. Um, so, but even within capitalism, there's various different ways to do that. So like in California, for instance, uh, on this recent election, there's a big debate about whether or not, uh, you know, Uber drivers should be, or not just Uber drivers, any freelancers should be allowed to have um, certain kinds of labor contracts with with Uber or with other employers, you know, or whether they have to have a very specific kind of labor contract that says they have to have set hours and bosses and all the rest of it. And so, you know, those are the kind of questions that I feel like we have in a capitalist system. It's not so much whether politics should regulate the the economy. Of course, it's always being regulated. There's all, always laws and various other things that are coming in. But it's about those types of questions, like what kind of labor contracts are we, do we think are are you know acceptable? Certain ones we do not think are acceptable, right? So most you know we're not going to have any kind of indentured servitude or anything like that. But um, but that diversity is really where I think a lot of the questions that we're talking about are. And you see this in questions about uh, tech regulation too. You know, should, should we have certain kinds of legal protections or not? Um, should we allow for various kinds of employment contracts? Well, Aaron, I think Aaron's question would, you know, if the government is going to kind of regulate or minimize some of these kind of feudalistic hierarchies. For example, we have existing rules that govern how corporations can form and how big they can get and how much of a sort of a monopolistic market share they can own in a given area or given country. And as you point out in the book, for Adam Smith, his vision of, I think it's a, a nation of shopkeepers, I think is the phrase, of people, you know, small businesses, 10 people working, people working for wages uh, that doesn't alienate them. And in that sense, it could have been the case that if Adam Smith could have jumped forward in time and met and had coffee with Karl Marx, who's starting to see the beginning of industrialization on a broader level, they could have had agreement about whether or not these firms are sort of not achieving the, the moral and the flourishing like ends that, that the system that Adam Smith described, you know, was supposed to do. Yeah, I think that there's, there's definitely some of that. And I think what's interesting about Marx too, is that he's coming in a very particular moment, you know, kind of what you might think of as the Dickensian height of industrial capitalism in the UK in particular at that time. Um, and so I think any of us that were kind of looking at that system would probably be pretty appalled by it. Um, and the question is, well, does that lens make sense in our contemporary system? Uh, who's the better kind of interpreter? Is it Marx or, or Smith or maybe some combination? What would they think of each other in a lot of different ways? Um, I well, do they think the same, so they that, had the same theory of value, right? They both had a labor theory of value to some extent, so they would agree on that. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of questions about that, but I do think uh, yeah, I mean they're both they both see things and and kind of so for similar starting points at least definitely. Um, I'm thinking about that. The question is, I think ultimately, um, so one thing that does go back to a point that that I think Aaron was maybe raising earlier is just that. You know, capitalism as an institutional system, one of its interesting features, I think you could say the same thing about democracy too, but certainly with capitalism, is it doesn't really have an aim exactly. So the point is not to create a society of, of equal people or to create a stable society or, um, you know, society that institutes justice or anything like that. Uh, there doesn't seem to really be any point at all. Um, it's rather just to kind of create the conditions that allow allow people to do certain kinds of things, namely, you know, work for whomever they want and vice versa and trade and, and those kind of things. And and out of this emerges a lot of possibilities for different kinds of lives, experiments in that way and uh, different, um, you know, the ability to get different things and live uh, perhaps better. So this is one of the, 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 the aspects of thinking about capitalism and ethics that is, is often very challenging, which is that there's no kind of imminent notion of kind of ethics or justice in the background of capitalism, right? And I think, um, so you don't have those resources by which to criticize it. Whereas I think with socialism, you probably do. A socialist system that is like highly inegalitarian or, or whatever, or that's focused on, you know, profit or something like that would be on its own lights defective, I would think. Um, with capitalism, it's less clear what that what that amounts to because there's a lot of different possibilities within a capitalist system. Um, so you can run, you can have worker-owned firms, you can have small firms, you can have big firms, and, and there's a diversity of these types of things. And so, 
So one of the things that you have to do in some sense is you have to bring whatever ethical um, material you have to bear. Uh, and that's going to be pretty diverse because not everyone's going going to um, to share the same backgrounds. And so part of what's going on is not just a, a marketplace in terms of these goods and services, but also, you know, a marketplace in terms of possibilities, right? So how do we want to have, you know, our, so Steve Jobs, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, right? And like, however much of this was hokum and how much it's real, it's hard to know. But like, part of his message at the outset with Apple was that we wanted to have a kind of democratized, humane version of computing or something like that. So where everybody could have access to the computer rather than it being merely um, the province of, you know, a mainframe or a big corporation or a government or something like that. And, you know, that's a vision. That's an ethical vision of a society, I think, um, that, you know, people can try to implement and put in place. And I think that's the kind of marketplace in terms of not just, um, goods and services, but also kind of visions of, of types of living and types of lives and societies that's also kind of on the table in this kind of society. One of the big objections to capitalism on the left is globalization. And I guess we're seeing that increasingly on the right as well. Um, and, you know, a, a capitalist firm wants to find new markets to sell its products in, and it also wants to identify potential new steps in its supply chain that are you know, cheaper, more efficient, or whatever else. And so looking outside the borders of its nation is one way to do that. But at the same time, it feels like that is you know, potentially capitalism forcing itself upon those who didn't ask for it and might not want it. You know, these indigenous societies or places that have a different sets of values than the capitalist West suddenly are kind of being dragged into capitalism without their without having much say in that. Is that is that a worry? Is that like a genuine objection to globalization? Well, so again, I would I would point back to this distinction between capitalism and commerce in a sense. So Adam Smith, you know, kind of famously argues that human beings have a, a natural propensity to truck barter and trade um, exchange. So the idea is supposed to be that, you know, humans in some sense are trading creatures. Um, we're social creatures and then we're trading creatures. And in one of the chapters in the book, I think I talk about Homo Mercator, you know, man, the trader in some sense, it's been a distinctive aspect of what it means to be human. And so in that sense, I think it would be hard. There, there are very few societies that don't engage in some kind of some kind of trade. Um, the question is just what institutional framework do they do it within? And typically these societies, uh, they do it within a, a framework uh, that is pretty closed and structured by various political elites so that they can kind of extract the most benefits out of it. And so, yeah, a lot of times that they're happy to deal with various kinds of firms on their terms, um, but then this can lead to really bad results for the indigenous populations. And, um, you know, I think insofar as Naomi Klein and all these people have a point, like the point is just that usually these firms from capitalist societies are dealing with societies that we would characterize as feudal. So there's not open access to the markets and there's not democratic control once they enter into them. So there's one side of the equation, which is that maybe these people don't have a choice to engage in trade on these terms. The other side is, um, you know, they're, they're usually being used as extractive resources uh, for their political system as well. And so, but the solution to that problem strikes me as being kind of more capitalism in a sense, or at least more capitalism and democracy in those countries, not less. So um, partly for the reason that it's not clear that people, people do seem to want to trade with one another and they seem to benefit from doing so. That seems to be a natural part of kind of human, human life. Um, but the question is on what term should we trade? And those are going to be determined oftentimes by the political system and, and typically by the domestic political system um, that they're engaging with. And so, you know, as a citizen of a country like the United States or as a shareholder in a firm or as just a person talking in a society like ours, you know, I think we can try to try to rein in um, certain kinds of practices that might be obviously extractive or exploitative. But at the end of the day, um, these societies, uh, unless they're, you know, kind of responsive to the to the interests and, and values of their people, it's very difficult um, 
for the for the kind of economic system to reflect those those interests i think one of the chapters of the book that i enjoyed because it's a I don't feel like it's discussed enough. You you, you definitely touch on, uh, you know, consumption, globalization, things we've been talking bad jobs and stuff. But the idea of why do we work so hard? Um, productivity gains have been through the roof. Keynes talked about fifteen hour work weeks. You've had science fiction authors for decades, you know, postulating that we would all kind of sit around as automation took over the basic things that we would have a lot more time to enjoy flourishing lives. Instead, you see a lot of people in capitalist countries working very hard to do different and new things. Um, and this is a critique by many people. Uh, is that a valid concern? Or is this just like basically tastes that people like to work and they like to work when they feel productive and that they're doing something they like? So it's not that big a deal if they're working hard. Yeah, I think it depends on who you're talking about. Like, I don't think it's that big a deal if I'm working hard. Like, I enjoy what I do and, um, you know, I do it because I want to do more of it. So in that sense, there's a, there's a consumption aspect. But that's not true for a lot of people. Um, and so, yeah, so then we have to ask, well, what what is what is driving this? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. Like, we, we raised a couple of different possibilities in the book. The other part of it is just that people value their leisure in very different ways. Um, so, so one thing that we talk about in the book is that people do tend to value leisure that is available, like, together. So, you know, people don't like to have Tuesdays off, right, if everybody else has Saturday and Sunday off because then they, you know, they, they can't do anything with other people. And that's true, you know, in a, across the board in a lot of ways. But it's also true that, you know, some people don't value that additional leisure time to the same extent. They'd rather work more. And so um, there's a lot of different things that we talk about in the book. But one thing that certainly my kind of view on this is that any way that you can kind of any way that individuals and families can kind of make those judgments uh, in, a, in a clear way, that is when they have more flexibility, whether to work more or not, and whether they can kind of judge what the relevant trade-offs are, that's when you're going to see people getting the most benefit from that arrangement. So I guess what I would say is like more flexible arrangements are good. And this is why, although I, I understand why people are attracted to uh, kind of the older moods of industrial organization um, and the benefits that might have come from that, the real drawback is flexibility. Um, so flexibility with time, but also just with whether you want to work more or not. Typically, there's a set number of hours you have to work in a lot of these kind of jobs, and you don't have a lot you can deal with. One of the real benefits of being an academic is, you know, we have a lot of flexible time arrangements. We can work when we want for the most part, uh, and that's great. Like, if you have a family or if you want to travel or whatever it might be, and I wish more people had options along those lines, and you might find, if that were the case, that some people would work less, but some people would probably work more. Um, but at least you would know that that was that was um, that was their kind of trade off with leisure and, and money or, or, or value or whatever it is, rather than something that you know is a vestige of you know the forty hour work week or the sixty hour work week or whatever it might ha happen to be. What about the worry that capitalism is at its core about consumption? It's about making things and then wanting other you know, convincing other people to want to consume those things and that this will lead us to, you know, there's no check against this. And so capitalism will ultimately lead to us consuming the planet or at least, you know, all of its resources. So we discussed the the question about the environment and the planet in, in one of the later chapters in the book. And I have a lot to say about that. I'll start with just the basic question about consumption though, because I've had this put in a lot of different ways um, in terms of Going back to even the early, some of the earliest critics of not just capitalism, but kind of emerging markets like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was very concerned that um, it wasn't just that we were consuming too much, but that we would be driven to, to consume and to behave in various ways merely a, 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 in reflection of other people. That is to kind of appear better than them or in, in a kind of arms race, a status arms race or, or whatever it might be. And you hear this a lot as kind of keeping up with the Joneses type thing. And we have a chapter on this as well in the book. Um, and so one thing I would say is, is this characteristic of capitalism? Is this, is this psychology characteristic of capitalism? And I would say, no, this is a human characteristic. Now, capitalism may kind of feed it in some ways, because one of the characteristics of capitalism is what we call consumer sovereignty, which is that basically 
what goods and services get produced are determined primarily by consumers. So if you have this kind of natural feature of human psychology, but then it's kind of supercharged by a system that basically caters to it, well then, yeah, you might probably get more of this thing in terms of the consumption aspects of it. Uh, whether or not it's good or bad, I think is is it really depends a lot on the context. And but I do think that you can very easily criticize these things psychologically and from a point of view of living a good life while still being totally open to the market providing these services uh, in various ways. If people stop demanding them, of course, they'll stop being produced. Um, now, whether or not there's some limit to that in terms of what the planet can sustain, um, I think the evidence that we looked at and that I've seen suggests that, if anything, more advanced capitalist societies are better at providing that stuff given their resources, uh, that is they're more efficient. So now whether or not there would be some upper limit of that, that's, that's certainly a possibility, but uh, I don't think we're within uh, the reach of that at any time soon. You know, in uh, the course of this episode, you've, we've discussed a lot of these classic criticisms of capitalism, which your reaction to them have been, I mean, you haven't, you know, you, you don't seem to be putting your foot down and saying that capitalism is so obvious, correct, like maybe like a Rothbardian and these other concerns are not really big concerns. You regard a lot of them as genuine concerns. So in that light, if you are someone who wants to sort of talk about capitalism and talk about it in a constructive fashion, what tips do you have for the way people should communicate about this? Um, if they're friendly to capitalism, and even if they're not, and just having a constructive conversation about how to compare these various systems? Well, I'd say two things. The first is that I think of capitalism as one of the, the great kind of inventions of all time. So probably up there with like the light bulb, the wheel, you know, the internal combustion engine, maybe more than some of these. But like those other inventions, um, they're incredibly important for human development and for human flourishing, but they also have a lot of downsides to them too. They're not obviously overweight in every aspect by the by the benefits. And so, so one of the things I would say for being constructive about it is, is seeing kind of the good and bad things that come along with this. And, you know, just like you think about, you know, the way that cars, once we introduce cars, they give us a lot of freedom, but they also, you know, create pollution. They, you know, they create traffic jams and they allow us to kind of live far away from our families and those kind of things that maybe has good aspects, but also bad, similarly with capitalism. And so I would say the starting point is for having a productive conversation is thinking about the things that you don't like trying to identify whether or not they are essential aspects of capitalism, whether they're kind of accidental aspects of capitalism or whether they're not aspects of capitalism at all. And then if they are clearly related, then thinking about ways that, you know, they might be alleviated or improved either by kind of um, advancing technology or kind of more efficient means of production or whatever it might be, or through kind of political, uh, or normative uh, changes. And so, so I guess it's thinking about this in this kind of wide range of possibilities. I mean, one of the other things we talk about in the book is that from our point of view, capitalism, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can do it the way that Denmark does it. You can do it the way the United States does it, the way that Australia does it, or Germany, or any other number of ways. And so to think, you know, there's not just one way to be capitalist. Uh, either historically or kind of philosophically. So I guess one thing I would say to people is just think about this, like the possibilities, your horizons are much broader than you probably imagine that they are. And um, capitalism can do both a lot of really good things and has probably some flaws too that need to be uh, dealt with in various ways. And to try to think through what those are is really the key of the project in our mind. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.